Chapter Seventeen of A Pocket Measure by Pansy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seventeen: An Open Door. We must have somebody who understands business better than we do to sort of manage us and things generally. This had been Addie Stowell's half laughing, half serious announcement on the day when the Stowell parlor having been secured and plans in general carefully matured the now thoroughly interested girls had met to arrange plans in detail addie's suggestion met with instant approval and at least a dozen voices declared that mrs spafford was just the one to take care of their heads and their money that lady who had foreseen the necessity for some such arrangement and believed moreover that it was important to select a woman rather than a girl for general manager resolved to accept the appointment without further discussion very well i will arrange to be your confidential clerk and manage the finances of the firm to the best of my ability until such time as we shall agree to have a younger and more sprightly assistant i make one proviso to the effect that you will empower me to secure a helper where i choose one who shall under my direction do whatever work which would naturally be in my province that i choose to give her this will not relieve me from responsibility for i will engage to be responsible for the doings of my chosen helper this was agreed upon and the managing clerk took the chair from this moment the process of organizing the somewhat ponderous firm and getting the machinery in running order went on rapidly and satisfactorily the truth is the managing clerk had not lain awake for several nights without results she knew exactly what she wanted her firm to do and the way to set them at it it is no part of my intention to take you through the details of this unique business you can imagine that the task was not an easy one and that there were constant pitfalls to avoid it is rather with an experience which as we see events grew out of this plan that i have to do mrs spafford in suggesting the importance of a sub-clerk for herself had a plan in mind her heart was very much set on getting nearer to her fair and yet so often sad-faced neighbor mrs dane evans getting near enough to help her for that she was sorely in need of help grew daily more evident the lines on her face were deepening and there was a pitiful pallor creeping over it that told of a weary heart struggling with some burden daily growing too heavy for her to lift could she be interested in this enterprise of the young ladies could she be prevailed upon to give them help by becoming associated with their leader not to assume more responsibility but to take certain duties easily performed and perhaps much to her taste upon herself and then could it be hoped that in the many conferences which this partnership of responsibility would involve they would get nearer to each other so near that in time she would accept mrs spafford as a tried friend and let her help if she could in the spot where she needed special help and then could not this servant of her master hope to lead that tired heart closer to the great burden-bearer such in brief was the plan toward which mrs spafford was quietly working not seeing her way clear but seeing a little entering place perhaps she resolved to push in that direction while she watched for more light it was over this entire matter that she studied and frequently prayed while she went about her home one afternoon not a word had been said to mrs evans as yet the managing clerk had been watching her opportunity so much depended on one's first impressions of things having prayed much over the whole scheme she found herself looking often from the window watching the clouds for the day was dull and rainy i don't know why it should seem so important to go over there on this day of all others she said to herself it is raining and is not a day when one would be likely to expect a call unless the business were urgent mine certainly can wait several days if necessary and yet i feel impelled to go this afternoon she made all necessary arrangements for the evening meal which she and warren looked forward always to enjoying together and settled herself at the window with her sewing 
there was no use in thinking about going out while the rain came down so steadily and the wind was blowing too a thoroughly disagreeable day it was easy to settle oneself outwardly yet she found that she had not gotten away from the impression that now was the time she sewed steadily for a few minutes then rolled up her work with a resolute air i will go now she said decidedly why shouldn't i i am not afraid of the rain and she may be very lonely i cannot get away from the feeling that this may be my opportunity resolved upon being as informal as possible and have her appearance fit the day she donned waterproof and rubbers and umbrella in hand sallied forth knocking at the little side door of the small house instead of ringing the front doorbell there was no response to her knock she stood dismayed so strong had been the impression that she was to come on just that afternoon that to find the house apparently deserted was a keen disappointment what then had the pressure meant which had seemed to her so like a voice directing her steps the house doesn't look closed she said still arguing with herself the curtains would be dropped if she had gone for the day i wonder if i may venture to the kitchen door perhaps they cannot hear a knock at this point so she stepped around the neat little box of a house to the kitchen door no it was ajar somebody was at home she knocked boldly no response and the wind was whirling her umbrella about in an insane fashion and the eaves were dripping on her head it was a very disagreeable spot in which to wait and yet somebody in this little house was at home and the resolute caller was unwilling to beat a retreat i'll step in she said boldly i am getting all wet standing here and i can explain the intrusion a moment more and she was in the tiny kitchen it was a scene of dreary desolation the fire in the cooking stove was out not decorously out as in many a thrifty household at that hour of the day but there was every indication that it had gone out ruthlessly and with malice aforethought the hearth was ash bestrewn a dishpan half filled with greasy water occupied the top while certain pots kettles and various other cooking utensils stood around in dismay the kitchen table too was a scene from which the tidy housekeeper turned quickly appalled at herself for venturing in and almost feeling as though mrs evans could never forgive her for looking on the desolations of that kitchen not a person was to be seen and the uninvited guest had just resolved to slip quietly away and ring perhaps at the front door if she could not bring herself to give up the visit when she heard that which startled her into a change of plans the unmistakable sound of bitter weeping came to her from the only half-closed door of the adjoining room not only weeping but lamentation a voice as of one in almost mortal agony either of body or mind all manner of conjectures rushed through mrs spafford's mind mrs evans might be ill might be in a sudden and terrible affliction and was certainly alone could she hesitate any longer on the ground of intrusion certain it was that she could no more go home with the wail of that voice in her ears than she could leave any other fellow-creature in distress and do nothing to help pausing only to set her dripping umbrella in a safe place and close the kitchen door she stepped quickly across the room pushed wide the intervening door and stood face to face with mrs evans who sprang suddenly to her feet a look of utter astonishment by no means unmingled with indignation struggling with the tears on her face mrs spafford it was every word she said but a whole volume of wounded pride and resentment over this unwarrantable intrusion were pent up in the voice mrs spafford stepped quickly to her side and laid a gentle hand on her arm my dear friend i seem to you to have been guilty of a great rudeness but indeed i mean no intrusion i came to your kitchen door on an errand and finding it ajar and no one quite ready to answer my knock i took the liberty of stepping in a moment out of the storm and heard your voice as if in pain or distress i feared you were alone and needed help and i came to offer it i will go away at once 
only believe me i had only a heart full of love and a longing desire to help you before this sentence was completed mrs evans had sunk again in a little heap on the couch from which she had risen and with the pitiful cry god knows i need help if any one on earth does burst into a perfect passion of weeping her visitor bent over her a distressed doubtful face ought she to go away from one in such bitter mental agony as this yet what could she say to help or comfort her that would not seem like an attempt to pry into the secrets of another dear friend she said and her voice was very tender i think you know where to look for help no matter what your trial or burden whether it be great or very small he is equally ready to have it brought to him and left there why don't you ask his help you are one of his own i am not i am not burst with passionate tears from the poor burdened heart i am nothing at all but a miserable woman who has made a failure of everything that i ever undertook i ought never to have taken the responsibilities of a wife and a housekeeper upon me i am a failure in every sense of the word i ought to die and go away out of the world and give others a chance to live what desperate talking was this from a woman who had been a beautiful and treasured bride but a short time before what could be said to her was not this a matter with which a stranger ought not to intermeddle what if it were only a childish outburst of passion over some misunderstanding between her husband and herself an outburst the memory of which and of the fact that there was a human eye witness would humiliate her to the very dust after it was over again and again even in those few moments did mrs spafford chide herself for having entered that kitchen door yet she could not leave her now and thus besides what if this were a genuine sorrow a pain which did not go away after the first outburst she remembered the drawn look on the young wife's face and greatly feared that the burden whatever it was stayed with her also what did that voice mean which persistently urged her toward coming over here in the rain of this very afternoon what was there that she ought to say to this child woman all these thoughts passed swiftly then she spoke again still in that low quieting voice dear friend whatever you are no matter what mistakes you have made no matter how unfit you feel you are dear to christ at this moment he loves you and waits for you he has infinite power and infinite wisdom and infinite forgiveness there is nothing that he cannot forgive and nothing that he cannot help you to do if it is right that you should do it i speak with authority for i have tried him yes with better authority than that for he has said it he shall deliver thee in six troubles yea in seven there shall no evil touch thee it is his own voice speaking go to him for help and as sure as the sun shines above these clouds you will get just what you need never mind whether you are one of his children or not claim the place of a child because you need to be and wish to be and mean to be one from this moment she spoke rapidly with a sort of eager positiveness and yet calmness it had the effect of quieting the bitter sobs but she could not tell how much heed had been given to the direction she waited in silence a moment then spoke again is there any way in which i could help you or shall i go away and come at another time she received no answer at all in great doubt as to what to do next she stood before the drooping figure with its face buried in its hands just as she had resolved to slip quietly out and trust to a note in which she would pour out her heart in sympathy mrs evans raised herself to a sitting posture brushed back the disordered hair from her swollen eyes and said with an effort at dignity i beg your pardon madame i have been saying some wild and foolish words to you i am afraid you must not think anything of them i do not mean what i said whatever it was it isn't often i give way to my feelings in this manner but indeed i am so miserable and so helpless the voice which had been growing more tremulous with each word 
suddenly broke into another burst of tears and the poor lady buried her face in her hands again mrs spafford's resolution was taken at least she could not leave a soul in distress afterward she might regret the intrusion but now that she had intruded that part could not now be helped she would do what she could to guide the struggling heart into the light she sat down beside mrs evans and laid a tender caressing hand on hers after all that seemed the utmost limit of her power but mrs evans was trying hard to control herself a moment more and she sat erect again i hope you will forgive me she said humbly i am very weak and foolish i really am in great trouble mrs spafford and yet it is nothing that i can explain my life seems such a failure to me i cannot write it because i do not know how to begin which way to turn i have meant right i meant to make the sweetest happiest home for my husband that a man ever had but it is not my fault nor dane's mrs spafford i may as well tell you it is the miserable money we cannot live on our salary we are in debt and going deeper every day and we see no way out and my husband blames me of course he does why should he not a wife ought to know how to spend the money that her husband earns in such a way as to bring him comfort and not misery and i have not done it and cannot do it i have tried and tried and made a miserable failure it is my fault you see after all to-day the whole dreadful sense of failure broke over me and i felt that i could not bear it any longer the troubles of this awful day have just broken down the little strength and pride that i had and i gave way utterly there now i have told you the whole wretched story without intending to i have humiliated myself to the lowest depths and dragged my husband down with me and the hot passionate tears rolled down her cheeks mrs spafford put a firm arm around the shrinking trembling form of the excited woman and spoke in quiet tones my dear friend let me talk to you a moment quietly and reasonably you have done no very dreadful thing in saying to me as a friend that you find it hard to bring your expenditures within your income that is not so strange a thing that it should seem to you a startling or even a humiliating matter neither is it a strange thing that you have failed i am older than you i think at least in experience i am many years older and i know just how hard a matter it is to get the whole bewildering machinery of household life into running order i am not surprised that you should have grown utterly discouraged and believed yourself to be making a humiliating failure what you need is a determination not to give way to any such feeling a resolution to meet and conquer this problem and show your husband that you are a general equal to the emergency it can be done and dear friend i want to repeat to you what i said at the outset that no perplexity is too commonplace to take to the lord jesus christ i know people who suppose it would be almost irreverent to take their domestic bewilderments to christ i cannot think what kind of a friend they imagine him to be if they are afraid to go to him with everything i should never have dared to assume the cares and responsibilities of our home if i had not known that i could go to christ for direction as to how to wisely spend the money he put into my hands and how to order all my affairs so that there would be no friction mrs evans had dried her tears and was looking with troubled and yet puzzled face at her guest that only makes me feel she said suddenly interrupting her just as a number of things you have said at other times have made me feel that your religion and mine were so utterly different that they could not both of them be religion and lately i have come to feel that among the other things that are utter failures in my life my christian experience stands first i never had any christian experience i thought i loved christ and wanted to do right and i said so when i united with the church but i tell you truly mrs spafford i have not known anything about him i have done nothing to please him and i shouldn't know how to commence and besides she looked down now and a deep flush spread over her heretofore pale face 
i will tell you the truth she said after a moment of hesitation i suppose it is very wicked indeed i know i am very wicked but i will speak the truth to-day if i never do it again if i could please my husband make his home what it should be i shouldn't care whether i pleased anybody else or not even christ End of chapter 17chapter eighteen of the pocket measure by pansy this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eighteen serving christ in the kitchen if mrs spafford was shocked by this last sentence she had resolved not to show it either by voice or manner it became apparent to her that mrs evans was under too strong excitement to weigh her words carefully or to have a realizing sense of what they conveyed and while this loyal servant of christ felt with a thrill of pain that it might be and doubtless was too true that this woman was putting the earthly love before the heavenly still the present did not seem the fitting time to help her realize the sin and folly of this she spoke in calm reassuring tones christ smiles on all unselfish human love you know and on none more surely than that sanctioned by marriage vows and true women love and honor you for your desire to be all that a wife can not ignoring as too many do the little things of life now dear mrs evans do you mind putting somewhat into detail the difficulties that just now present themselves possibly they are such as my longer experience can help you surmount i do not of course mean a detail that will be unpleasant to you but in short let us lay aside formality entirely i am a neighbor and i am a friend let me help you what is the special burden to-day you see i am well aware that each day in a housekeeper's life has its special burden at the sound of her visitor's quiet voice and matter-of-fact sentence mrs evans who was not by nature a lover of scenes and who had been really struggling to regain composure felt her overwrought nerves growing calmer and presently said a vivid flush overspreading her face i can hardly see how you can help despising me i almost despise myself the simple truth is so very humiliating i have been acting like a spoiled child instead of a woman nothing is very dreadful indeed nothing dreadful in any sense has happened it is just a culmination of small difficulties they have been gathering and gathering about me for weeks and this miserable afternoon i broke down under them her lip was quivering and she was on the very verge of breaking down again it is the old story of the last straw that disabled the poor camel said mrs spafford good-humouredly without a trace of sentiment in her voice and yet some way the voice conveyed sympathy i know all about that i have had just such days sometimes the last straw is an exceedingly hateful ill-shaped one in what form did it appear to you a little gleam of a smile quivered for a moment on mrs evans's face it is ill-shaped certainly she said quickly and i think she has been more hateful during the last three or four days than i ever thought a human being could be mrs spafford my betty went away this morning just before lunch-time she has only been with me four weeks and has been by far the worst one of them all i have had nine this morning she served the most insufferable breakfast burnt toast and dreadful coffee i don't know what she could have done to it nor to the chop for that matter i know we couldn't eat it even the potatoes were dreadful baked potatoes i didn't think they could be spoiled but these were soft and wet and oh miserable mr evans went to his business without so much as a cup of coffee or a bit of bread and when i went into the kitchen as soon after as i dared to remonstrate with betty a little and to see if she could not promise to try to do better before i had spoken a dozen words she became fearfully angry used dreadful language declared she was overworked and underpaid she was what they call a cheap girl mrs spafford this last spoken with a burning blush 
i thought i would try her and see if a little of our heavy expense could not be cut down in that way but indeed i paid her what she said she had been getting and you know for two of us she hardly could be overworked mrs spafford hardly knew whether to laugh or cry over the anxious questioning sound in the trembling voice its owner had evidently been terribly shaken by the formidable betty in the morning and could not yet speak of her with composure and what was the conclusion of betty's wrath she asked resolved not to commit herself by giving an opinion either way at present oh she went away she said she would declared that nothing could tempt her to be abused in this house any longer and she would warn every girl against me she would leave my character at the intelligence office and i would find myself spotted whatever that means i was perfectly amazed i had not said anything to call forth such an outburst and i thought she was excited over something else and would quiet down if i left her to herself for a while so i went away and stayed upstairs all the morning so that the sight of me would not anger her but when i discovered that it was long after lunch time i came down to see why she had not rung for me and to make some arrangements for dinner this evening and she was gone and oh mrs spafford if you could see the kitchen she left whereupon mrs spafford drew a little breath of relief then the poor lady had been too much absorbed in her grief to realize that her guest had seen it the fire was entirely out and the breakfast dishes not touched and a great many dishes that must have been used yesterday and left unwashed standing around kettles you know and saucepans and ugly greasy black dishes with things sticking to their sides nothing more utterly disgustful than the look on mrs evans's face can be imagined her guest's laugh rang out merrily at last she could not help it but her friend's trials were too real to admit of laughter it is dreadful she said with a meek face to be foolish and so dependent upon others but i have really been in utter despair this afternoon not for that reason simply she hastened to explain while the shadow instantly deepened on her face but as you say it was a sort of last straw not so much of a straw to me either for i never made a coal fire in my life and though i tried hard to set that one going the ugly black lumps looked fiercely at me and stayed as black as before after all the waste paper in the house had been used and a great many matches mr evans certainly ought to expect his dinner when he gets home since he went without his breakfast but what can he possibly find to eat in this house i cannot see and the rain was so steady it prevented my going out to find another girl indeed to tell you the truth i had a horror of trying to get another it seemed to me i would rather starve and so the whole miserable sense of my failure in every way as a mistress or as a worker rushed over me and in addition to all the rest just overwhelmed me dear mrs spafford i don't know why i am telling you all this foolish unwomanly story wasting your time and pouring into your ear a tale that can certainly be nothing but weariness to you it is not like me thus to parade my annoyances it is not indeed i ought to beg your pardon she had sat erect during this last sentence dried away the last tear from her hot cheek and was struggling hard to put on the sweet dignity of hostess which was generally so becoming to her meantime her guest thought rapidly taking a surreptitious glance at her watch should she insist upon taking this troubled wife to tea with her sending little tim who did her errands down to watch for the car that generally brought the two husbands and so have one of those quiet tea parties that she was always telling warren about her bread was fresh and excellent she had made a treat for supper in the shape of a soft ginger cake and the potatoes which she meant to warm by the addition of a few bread crumbs and an egg could be made into patties and do duty for four. Oh yes the way was plain enough to carry out this project but was it the best way swift thinking even while mrs evans was trying to call back her matronly dignity then she shook her head no it wouldn't do the sore-hearted young life was not in a tea-party mood 
and it was just possible that there had been words passed between husband and wife during the attempt at eating that uncomfortable breakfast which had made wounds if this were so they could be better healed between husband and wife alone she must give up her little tea then the other plan should be made to work she slipped her watch back into its pocket and spoke briskly you are telling me all this because you are a sensible woman and paid me the compliment of believing my offer of sympathy sincere and you know that to a christian woman there is no higher privilege than to be able to help a sister in christ now dear friend listen to me i don't wonder a kitchen left in the plight which you describe should look formidable to you but it doesn't to me i have conquered one many a time coal fire and all moreover i can show you how to do it so that it will cease to be a hopeless thing to you now i want you to further prove your faith in my hearty friendship by letting me go with you right into that said kitchen and reduce it to a state of meek and dainty subordination then you will get your husband as nice a little supper as he ever ate in his life get it with your own two hands and my word for it he will have an unusual appetite with eyes that were full of astonishment did mrs evans for a moment gaze on her guest that this proposal brought her into contact with a form of friendship to which she had heretofore been a stranger was evident that she was puzzled to know how to receive it was equally evident only a moment the look of bewildered irresolution rested on her face and then she said suddenly i believe you do mean every word you say thank you i need help i believe i need just the kind that you are willing to give i will accept it gratefully there was a happy light in mrs spafford's eyes this simple sincere answer had shown her that she was not mistaken in her estimate of this fair young housekeeper she was a woman to be helped not only but to be loved feeling still assured in her heart that this was no time for more important matters without more ado mrs spafford urged an immediate assault on the kitchen and thither the two women went mrs evans only pausing to say in a distressed tone if i only had a large apron that would protect your dress never mind her guest answered cheerily my dress is only calico and washes nicely then she set to work on that forlorn stove you see she said resolving upon working and lecturing at the same time coal is splendid for burning after it has been coaxed long enough it is very hard-hearted needs a pretty large gathering of kindlings blazing all around it to set it a good example i suppose this is the place where they are kept is it not your house is arranged like mine saying which she opened a door disappeared for a moment and returned with her arms full of neat billets of wood of uniform length these she built up with skilful interlacing inside the wide-mouthed monster mrs evans looking on with interested yet incredulous face she had had an experience with these heartless black lumps that the skilful engineer was piling in with such composed face she did not believe they would burn but they did they are conquered the younger lady said with a relieved sigh as the flames shot up through the interlacings and curled themselves skillfully around the black lumps which soon began to emit a flame peculiar to themselves they recognize a superior power and do not dare to act as they did with me so short a time ago now if you are a skillful general of a disordered kitchen possessing the ability to marshal pans kettles and pails into orderly ranks and make them retire to their places you know how steadily the small kitchen yielded to the spell that was now upon it if on the other hand you have the misfortune to be one of those who though able to play sixteen pages of chopin or some other distinguished composer without a mistake yet look with absolute dismay yes even terror on the interminable paraphernalia of a well-stocked kitchen you can appreciate the feelings with which mrs evans watched the rapid transformation of hers they were such tiny places after all kitchen and pantry and the water was so hot and soap so plentifully used that to a skilful workman it could not you know take much time 
but it looked like magic to mrs evans i wish i could do it she said eagerly as she lifted the shining plates from their bath in the hot rinsing water and set them to drain after the copy which had been set her how smooth they feel and how shining they are betty would not recognize one of them mrs spafford i tell you truly if i only need not have another of those girls enter my house i should be happy enough to shout i cannot tell you what a terror they all are to me they do nothing right and i know just enough to be sure of that but i don't know how to help it and i am afraid of them all why don't you do without them said mrs spafford coolly little bits of homes like yours and mine are too small and precious for hired hands to touch if we have strength enough to guard them from it i just enjoy getting dinner for warren and we have the coziest little breakfasts mrs evans's eyes brightened wistfully if i were only you she said and she thought of the three dollars that had to be transferred each week from her purse to that of her tormentor if it could be saved if i were only you but i don't know anything about it learn said mrs spafford coolly as though it were a very simple matter you would be surprised to see how soon you could manage this nice little home to your entire satisfaction mrs evans what are we going to get for a treat for your husband this evening the bright look faded from the weary housekeeper's eyes there is very little in the house she said her cheeks flushing it rained so i depended on betty i meant to have a leg of lamb and some vegetables too late for those declared the cook besides we want to be dainty you know not go into anything so gross as legs of lamb this with a merry laugh i see a dish of potatoes in the pantry do you ever stew them in milk we used to have cream when i was a girl and lived where milk was a necessity not a luxury but now i use milk and find it answers nicely i can show you how to serve a dish that i fancy you will enjoy mrs evans gratefully agreed to be shown notwithstanding the fact that in her ignorant heart she was skeptical about making that ugly-looking dish of cold potatoes fit to eat still her forehead did not clear i wish betty had controlled her temper long enough to have baked bread she said sadly we have nothing but baker's bread and my husband dislikes it so much then let us have some dear little soda biscuits as light as puff balls i saw a cup of sour milk on the shelf and felt just like taking it down and making something nice sour milk said poor mrs evans aghast at the idea yes indeed you have eaten the little white puffs often i presume they are easy to make it is the very thing i will set you to making them while i get the potatoes ready to cook then while they are baking you can cook the potatoes there is some steak said mrs evans hesitatingly mr evans doesn't dine downtown he only takes a plain lunch so i like to have meat for him but i don't know that i can manage steak very meekly she spoke she knew no more about broiling steak than she did about those biscuits which mrs spafford so composedly talked of her making oh yes you can declared the brisk voice that is easy now about the biscuit there is a quart measure first you sift a quart of flour now just so much butter wait this little plate will measure it nicely and serve you for the future thus she moved with careful steps putting her directions as clearly and as briefly as possible until mrs evans her face flushed her eyes shining stooped and set in the oven a row of small round balls that she verily believed would never be anything but burnt dough how could anything so simple and so quickly done ever transform itself into something fit to eat but when the stewed potatoes were tested with a delicious mouthful according to mrs spafford's direction when the bit of juicy steak lay meekly between the wire gridiron and was being skillfully turned and emitted a delicious odor through the kitchen and when the lumps of dough came out of the oven the plumpest flakiest little puffs that her eyes had ever beheld 
when the tea was steeping and her husband's key was heard in the front door and mrs evans was alone her good angel having but a few minutes before washed her hands rolled down her sleeves and vanished through the back door having given this parting word now mrs evans i want you to tell me whether your husband likes stewed potatoes or not especially of your stewing and soda biscuit of your making mrs evans thinking of her of the words that she had spoken that day of the work her hands had wrought and of the courage and hope which she had breathed into her had much ado to keep the tears from starting again they would doubtless have had their way but for the fact that her delicately broiled bit of steak was ready to be served the tears were stayed but her heart was full of grateful love as she said to herself with a resolute little pressure of her lips as though she were speaking the words in her heart she is a blessed woman i believe god sent her to me in my misery she doesn't know all she has done for me to-day there is something else that she can teach me i shall know the difference between her religion and mine she has something that i have not and if it is for me i mean to have it you will have to dine off bread and milk to-night declared mrs spafford with smiling eyes to her astonished husband who was reviving their neglected fire when she appeared through the rain at the side door i have been out all the afternoon i found an open door which i have entered i verily believe for the master's sake god bless you he said looking down on her tenderly when she had told so much of her story as she felt she had a right to tell if you can make a home over there like this of ours i believe you will save two souls instead of one from shipwreck End of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of the pocket measure by pansy this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nineteen the ends meet it is not my purpose to give you a detailed account of my friend mrs spafford's life nor of her plans of work indeed i could not if i would the story of a life must of necessity be fragmentary bits here and there from actual everyday experiences it may be that some have mistaken my design in telling you somewhat of this true woman's experience i may have been expected to give in detail the management of a christian household on small capital all the little economies the plans the self-denials the failures such was by no means my intention mrs spafford's quiet economies and self-denials shall be left like those of hundreds of other christian women with god and her husband i may even have been expected to prove that she found it possible to keep to the bible doctrine of tithe giving and yet not starve thank the lord that many and many a christian life proves that there is little need that mrs spafford's history should be added the truth is i love to linger over these first beginnings but there is need for haste and i must ask you to step over a chasm of almost two years before you take another peep at the pretty little home and i must own that you will find it in shadow there has been much sunshine during those two years there has been progress in the mission work to which my friend has devoted as much of her means and her heart as was possible there has been a white day in her life when she went to the great reunion of christian women met to compare notes and devise plans for the future she has had the pleasure of seeing a great church filled to overflowing with christian women women on the platform presiding planning managing with the skill of generals trained to the service and enlisted for life or during the war she has heard the voice of prayer from lips that were once unaccustomed to the service and from lips that once were sure they could not speak save in the solitude of their own rooms she has heard addresses such as thrilled her heart and nerved all her powers to new effort addresses from the lips of women she has even lived to see mrs bacon appointed a district collector for the woman's board and heard her offer in silvery tones an address of welcome to delegates from a distance oh yes she knew the world moved 
meantime it had moved in a quieter but no less certain way right around her i hope you do not imagine that that cooperative business enterprise was a failure i very much doubt whether anything begun as that was with such an end in view and guided every step of the way by prayer is ever a failure certainly this was not the stowell parlor had found its level a bright long room lighted with many windows brightened with flowers in summer time and with potted plants and flourishing vines in winter brightened the windows and the tables with every variety of glowing color in worsted and silk every step of the way had been a success that is after they were fairly started there were always drawbacks at first with which to contend there were some to say that the scheme was a wild one and would never succeed there were some to grow weary of it very soon and abandon their efforts there were some to sigh and predict failure because the whole world did not rush in upon them from the very first to admire and to buy and yet it had moved steadily forward it was on an assured footing now there was every sort of fancy article to be had that you might choose to order if not in stock the trim white aproned miss with demure face and laughing eyes who waited on you with pencil and paper and announced herself the order clerk would quietly take your minute directions taking care that they should be minute by becoming a skilful questioner taking care that they should be in black and white with your own name appended and the date at which you might expect the same taking care too that you should have a duplicate so that you might expect neither more nor less than had been ordered so careful was this new firm of its reputation there was a variety counter where could be found pins and needles and thread and tape and buttons of exactly the right size and color and shape there were endless little useful articles belonging to that class of goods that people never think about until they see and then know they must have right away it took a little time to accustom the patrons to the fact that this unique store was only open on one afternoon of each week and then for a limited time for the first few weeks the partners were continually informed that if they were open every day they would get a great deal more custom gradually however ladies began to say i suppose i could wait until saturday for that purchase and then buy it of the girls it would encourage them in the course of time this statement also changed and took the form of oh wait until saturday and buy your buttons or your edges or your collars at the what not for such was the simple suggestive name that their establishment assumed it will really pay you to wait they have such a nice variety and are so very reasonable in their prices besides if they haven't exactly what you want they will take your order and manufacture or purchase for you they have a buying clerk who can really suit you better in the city than you can yourself and save all the wear and tear of running around besides when mrs spafford knew that this form of talk had come to be the prevailing one as regarded their place of business she settled down into satisfaction of the constant strain upon time and strength and patience that it was to this one woman to keep all the wheels of her delicate machinery properly oiled and running smoothly i will not attempt to tell she had one all-sustaining motive she knew that it was with her work done literally for the master she earnestly believed that it was not only an institution for making a little money in a legitimate way but that it was a training school for were not all these young ladies connected with the firm learning not only to earn but to give systematically regularly conscientiously in mrs evans she had found just the helper she needed it was her exquisite taste backed by the other's educated judgment that secured to the firm its reputation for having just the very things that matched and that one wanted as for mrs evans what had not the enterprise done for her of the earnest active young ladies band that had grown out of this enterprise or rather grown along with it and become a vital element of its existence 
it shall be my pleasure to tell you more at length some other time for the present let it rejoice your heart to know that the scheme widened daily not only as a business but as a circle of influence nothing that she had ever undertaken with an eye single to the glory of her master had so filled mrs spafford's heart with joy and gratitude as did this whole matter yet as i told you in the beginning over the small happy home there had come shadows not light ones drooping low for a little then flitting away oh there had been many such of course mrs spafford had expected them she was not a child nor yet an enthusiast it had not been an easy matter at all times to make ends meet especially had such been the case when extra expenses came upon them for they had had many an extra expense who has not many a time had the careful accountant rejoiced over that fund ever so tiny though it was which she had been able to lay aside from time to time as an extra many a time had she rejoiced over the monthly dividends from the little firm which though so small that they would have made a business man shout in derision had added not a little to her hoarded extra out of the necessity for this extra had also grown great satisfaction for the husband looking on with eager eyes helping where he could standing in manly admiration where he could not was one day enabled to get his eyes open so wide that he discovered even five cents for a cigar to be an expense that he certainly could avoid if he chose and seeing the example ever before him of self-forgetful economy he could not but choose it is true his eyes were opened wider than that in laying it aside he first discovered what an almost necessity it had become and over this discovery he was so shocked that i think he would have had courage to continue the struggle even without the motive of economy but that it was a struggle at all was a mortification to him i declare he said to himself speaking firmly i'll never be a slave to any habit i did not dream of such a thing if five cent pieces should ever come as plenty with me as flies in august and there is no danger i'll never smoke cigars again not long thereafter his eyes were opened wider he had not thought to tell callie it was such a small matter and he was half ashamed that he had not done it before it did not seem necessary to let her know what a struggle it had been so he kept his small secret at least he thought so as if such a husband could keep a secret from such a wife what has become of them she asked him one evening and so innocent of her feeling was he that he asked in astonishment of what the cigars that were to piece out your lunch oh why become of them i dare say they are smoke by this time somebody has puffed them into thin air though i didn't how did you know callie she gave him only a very searching and very happy look in answer then after a minute how could i help knowing why did you do it warren a variety of reasons little cross questioner in the first place it occurred to me that although a very small leak it was one that might as well be stopped you see you set me such a persistent example on that score that i could not well help learning and then well callie i don't know how you discovered anything about it but you may as well know the truth i found the habit had grown on me was harder to break than i supposed much harder i could hardly have believed what a struggle it would be and that convinced me that i must break off not only for the present but forever of course the lord's freedmen cannot afford to bind themselves with any sort of chains when they knelt together for family worship which they did in a very few minutes after this conversation there was that in his wife's prayer in the words and in the quiver of her voice as she laid her joy before the lord that her husband said directly they arose from their knees said it with his arms clasped close around her my dear if i had known if i had dreamed that it was such a sorrow to you i should have turned from the whole thing long ago 
what self-gratification is there important enough for a man to be the cause of an hour of pain to his wife then i ought to have told you long ago how i felt said callie her eyes brimming with glad tears and i think so too at the same time i admit that she thought within her glad heart that not all men were like her husband in his willingness to give up self for his wife's sake and i am afraid i think that too meantime though i am long in introducing him there was another and a very important reason why callie was glad do you think she wanted the father of her son to set him an example as a tobacco smoker not she where is the mother who does and the boy was six months old able to watch with very wise eyes what was going on in the world who is going to say how soon he might have thought the curl of cigar smoke in the air a very pretty thing or how early he might have become accustomed to a tobacco-tainted breath as something inseparably connected with his small world his name of course was warren but what did the glad young mother call him for a pet name but war i am not sure that there was not a queer significance to the name in her heart what war there had been between her scantily filled purse and her conscience during the days when she was fashioning his cunning little garments dear me doesn't every mother know all about it the lovely embroidery the delicate flannels and muslins and cambrics and lawns too fine and fair and sweet for any but those who seem to have just come from heaven the little babies yet this mother had come off victor soft flannels oh yes indeed they were in her estimation a necessity delicate white robes many of them they too were necessities but they were not so fine nor so long nor so daintily tucked as the mother's fond foolish heart would have liked and the embroidery that apparent necessity to baby existence if we may judge from the wardrobes of many was very scarce embroidery such as she would have liked her darling to wear would make awful inroads on the scanty purse and embroidery such as she could make she was well aware made awful inroads on time and strength so she made war with the wish to smother her darling under such costly folly and as i said came off victor it wasn't so hard after she went shopping one day with a lady who paid three dollars for a yard and a quarter of the pretty stuff and would not join the missionary society because she could not afford it after all she said to warren such people help they make one see the folly the inconsistencies in things more quickly than they can be shown in any other way but her perverse husband answered then it is a pity they wouldn't work a trifle faster and let more people see it yes i am telling a true story they did it six months had there been this pretty little new body to think of and care for and not a penny of debt incurred neither had a penny been borrowed from the sacred jewels in the box on the mantel it wasn't easy oh dear no there was much self-sacrifice much planning much diligent forethought and afterthought there were quiet little self-denials practised which cost some strength of will but which after all left the head and heart calmer perhaps than they would otherwise have been there were industrious hours over plain sewing for certain neighbours who were glad to get a deft needlewoman so convenient to them there was every penny of the carefully hoarded extra used why not they had said gaily to each other this happy mother and father isn't he a blessed little extra and they had kissed him until he cried ungrateful baby it needs planning and patience and sacrifice but it can be done don't i tell you it was done yet the shadow fell the hot days came and hot nights when the baby fretted and moaned and in many ways made good so his father declared his right and title to his pet name these nights were followed by weary days when the mother toiled and toiled and felt she had not strength to do and so left undone 
with a conscientious self-sacrifice that only those can understand who have been obliged to turn away from duties that they longed to perform if baby had only kept well the long warm days would have been lived through joyfully but he grew steadily weaker and thinner they did not tell their grave forebodings to each other this husband and wife and by so much more did they press heavily on each heart still they tried to be brave before each other but the father's very step as he hurried up the little walk when the business day was done grew to have a nervous anxious sound in it and his eagerly put question before the door was fairly opened how is he to-night callie had such an undertone of pain in it that she in pity learned to watch for his step and to say with a smile when she could we are no worse i think papa yet they both knew that not to be better was in reality to be worse if we could only get to cooler quarters the father said occasionally and directly he had spoken he turned away quickly from his wife's wistful eyes truly they felt as though it would have been almost as reasonable to talk about getting to heaven meantime another anxiety menaced them mr spafford the senior partner of the firm had said to him you must hold yourself in readiness to go to paxton at an hour's warning there is some business pending which may result in our having to send you out in haste the fact is howell and company are in difficulties and i'm afraid at this point he pushed to the outer door and drew his chair nearer his clerk and there ensued a business explanation to the details of which mr spafford had much ado to give attention distracted as he was with the query as to how he would manage about leaving callie and the boy and with the awful thought what if the boy should grow worse in the night while he was away he did not like to admit even to himself that the baby's illness was such as to justify him in asking to be excused from the trip if he had he was by no means sure it would have done any good his employers were men not given to thinking of much that did not concern business still he made all necessary preparations for his wife she heard the news with a dismayed face yet promptly realized the importance of satisfying his employers i wish mrs evans were at home was the instant outreach for help she knew many people and they were very kind and she liked them yet after all how few there are among our acquaintances whom we are willing to call in to be one with us in perplexity and trouble mrs evans had come to be such an one but she had gone with her husband into the country during his vacation addie stowell would stay with you her husband said and charlie will sleep here to be within call in case you should need he did not finish the sentence he knew he would be understood there was always before them the possibility of baby growing suddenly worse and the need of a summons to the doctor so all the preparations were made though mr spafford said cheerily after all i may not have to go and as the days passed and he heard no more about it and a little cooler weather came and the baby seemed better the cloud lifted so mr spafford was not prepared for his senior employer's sudden message delivered very near the close of a busy day mr spafford we have had bad news from paxton i'm afraid our worst fears are to be realized still you may be able with promptness to effect something you will need to start at daylight i regret that there is no earlier train but that will bring you in soon after midnight ready for early work the next morning well sir this last in an inquiring tone for preoccupied with business as he was he could not fail to see the swift dismayed look that overspread his clerk's face the dismay was very apparent in the tones of his voice but to-morrow will be sunday End of chapter nineteen chapter twenty of the pocket measure by pansy this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty measured by trial well said the senior partner 
irritation visible on every line of his face i am aware of that of course on ordinary occasions we are not in the habit as you know of infringing on the sabbath rest of our employees but this is a special emergency a large amount of money is at stake and you can of course see the necessity for your being in paxton at the earliest possible hour on monday morning without doubt his clerk was listening to the measured words every sentence of which indicated the senior's annoyance in thus being called to account and obliged to explain his actions he was listening but he seemed in doubt as to how to answer for he hesitated and the blood mounted higher in his face and the silence between them was becoming oppressive at last raising a pair of keen eyes he spoke in a firm yet sufficiently respectful tone i cannot engage to break the sabbath sir even in a business emergency you cannot no sir my principles prejudices some might call them are very strongly marked in that direction i cannot conceive of a business emergency which would make it seem right to me to ignore the plain direction remember the sabbath day to keep it holy for a moment the senior partner seemed to be too much astonished to speak he was not a high-tempered man at least not in the sense in which that phrase is generally understood he never scolded never descended to the level of loud words or excited tones yet his word was absolute unquestioned law through the entire establishment and it had heretofore been mr spafford's business simply to obey in view of the long education that this man of large business had had as an undisputed sovereign it is perhaps no wonder that he could for a moment only look his astonishment over the sudden rebellion very well he said at last turning away and moving with his usual dignified step toward the inner office the words were quiet the manner in no sense changed yet mr spafford knew that he was in great and dangerous disfavor with his chief knew it as well as he did less than an hour afterward when one of the cash boys gave him a note written in the senior partner's clear firm hand which read as follows enclosed fine check for fifty dollars the amount due and accept the thanks of the firm for the faithful manner in which you have hitherto served them we shall of course have no further need of your services after to-day hoping that you will in the future meet with the success that your industry deserves we remain yours truly and then through the mist that the faithful clerk felt gathering over his eyes he could see the signatures of the firm he even took occasion to notice the graceful curve of the capital b and the flourish around the d so small were the details with which his mind occupied itself and yet he also saw his home with his beloved wife and its sick baby and the great and increasing need that there was for money he saw himself out of employment for weeks perhaps for months and his baby growing worse slipping away from them perhaps for want of those things which money could procure he saw actual want staring them in the face yet he went on with the column of figures he was adding reached a result that he knew was correct signed the name of the firm to half a dozen papers wiped his pen with usual care closed and locked his desk delivered the keys to the proper authorities said good evening much as usual to his fellow clerks and went out for the last time from the store where he had served faithfully yet the weight of the trial had told somewhat on his face by the time he reached home must have done so though he strove hard not to let it and said to himself as he went up the walk that he would not tell callie until after supper nor then indeed unless the baby was even better than usual yet he had not been in the little dining-room five minutes before she said warren what is the matter then of course he told her he spoke cheerfully even smilingly tried to make as little of it as possible but she stood bewildered she seemed unable to take the idea in discharged she said discharged 
repeating the word in a dazed sort of way thinking how strange it sounded connected with her husband's name why warren what can you mean then the whole story had to be gone over and after all it was well it was such a short story so simple and untragical in its details that it might almost have quieted the excitement of them both to go over it yet it meant to them serious business they both knew it meant we have lost that which was our daily bread there was no bank account however small there was not even an extra laid away in the private slide of Callie's writing desk there was only that last check out of which to pay a month's rent and the doctor's bill and provide the hundred daily necessities of life for how long i will not deny that there was a sense of terrible sinking in mrs spafford's heart she had never longed for money as she did just now as she had been longing that very afternoon because of the white-faced darling in the crib and she had never in her life touched so near to actual poverty yet the first thing she did after she took in the entire situation was to move her chair around the other side of the crib closer to her husband's and kiss his white forehead and the first words she spoke were after all warren there is nothing to regret you did just what was right indeed there was no opportunity for choice you could not do otherwise and the lord knows all about it thus it was that the shadows in that home grew longer the days passed strangely that is the first five or six warren took his breakfast later lingered over it beyond the time for family worship cared tenderly for war in a hundred ways restful alike to mother and baby did a dozen little things for their comfort during the day that he had never before had time for then went out on a weary round of calls in the hope of finding somewhere a situation coming back every night a trifle more disheartened than he was the night before it was not the time of year when vacancies were plenty if in fact in the overcrowded city there is ever such a time he got the check cashed with a curious pitiful wonderment as to how or when he would get another and paid the rent and laid aside some that he hoped could be kept to give to the doctor and brought home with him five little gold dollars that he showed after tea to his wife oh warren she said understanding them at once i was wondering about them don't you suppose do you think i mean would it be wrong to use the five dollars this time we have no income now you know for a little and baby needs a few things shall we borrow them for this emergency callie he said and his tone was low and strangely tremulous though there was no reproach in it we promised to swing off and trust him for emergencies so we did and i am very faithless put them in the box warren indeed i did not mean to steal the lord's jewels i only thought of borrowing she spoke quickly and had some ado to keep back the tears but he gave the shining things to her and with her own hands she dropped them into the blue velvet box before many days they had that which put the loss of the father's situation into the background without any question baby was seriously worse oh the dark dark days which succeeded each other now how can i tell you about them ah me how many hearts there are in this world that need no telling the father made no more efforts to find a situation indeed there were hours in which he was able to thank god that he had none no duty to keep him from ministering now to his child and his wife for one seemed to need help almost as much as the other his days and nights were alike spent in tireless watching and waiting that one word expresses to the initiated a whole volume in itself alert helpful watching is sometimes not so hard but the waiting for what may i apparently is coming with slow steps indeed but still coming that is what wears out human lives 
it was one of those breathless summer mornings which occasionally followed breathless nights baby lay in a limp almost lifeless heap in the small white crib too weak he felt even to smile in answer to the wistful eyes bending over him neither father nor mother had left him for an hour of rest during the night indeed there was not a spot in the house in which they could have rested had they tried no spot where they could get away from that faint wail sometimes it seemed to the father's heart when occasionally he closed his eyes for a moment to rest them that he should hear it always after this wherever he went whatever happened the long summer night had stretched its slow length along mother and father alternately walking up and down the room trying to rest the tired baby or sitting in the large rocker pillowing him tenderly on one arm and gently fanning him with the other now the longed-for morning had come at last and as they looked at the pinched features of the child and then at each other they needed not words with which to say that the night had made sad ravages it was plain that he had failed much for the first time since his sickness they did not attempt going through with the form of a breakfast that much warren spafford had regularly insisted on indeed he had several times made a fragrant cup of coffee himself brought it with his own hands to his wife and with tender firmness insisted on her drinking it this morning he sat almost as limp and wearied looking as the baby before him making no suggestions in regard to food or rest the awful depression of disappointment and foreboding was upon him mrs spafford turned to him at last her eyes heavy less with weariness than fear warren don't you think you might find the doctor before he starts on his daily round and get him to come earlier don't you think there may be need of it i am afraid there is he spoke in a low hopeless tone it was evident to her that he had lost all heart her own began to give great throbs of pain but she struggled for composure for baby's sake she must not yield now she might soon have plenty of time for tears when she had empty arms warren rose at once i will try for it he said still listlessly and he sought for his hat and went away neither of them remembering to break their long night's fast meantime however there had come another presence into the house mrs evans had returned home but the night before had run over immediately to see how her friends were and knew all about the great fear that enthralled them she came quickly now into the kitchen uninvited as her kitchen had been entered once she moved with quiet yet skilful step around the small domain where the neatness of desolation reigned everything was in the sort of order that betokens that very little is being used in that region skillfully she built up the fire in the little stove rapid movements to and fro one journey home and just as mr spafford entered the front door she pushed open the door of the little parlor which had long since been converted into a downstairs nursery i found him warren said he says he will try to be here in half an hour then mrs evans go right into the dining-room dear you and mr spafford and eat a mouthful of breakfast you will find it all ready oh yes you must for baby's sake you know he will need strong arms and a great deal of care to-day he is sleeping quietly now isn't he really resting perhaps i will sit beside him and watch every movement go mrs spafford because it is right you know what winning sweetness there was in her voice and a certain quiet persistence of manner that carried a sort of strength to the tired hearts of father and mother she is right callie warren said trying to rouse from his lethargy right and thoughtful don't let us be ungrateful come now you know just how this suggestion sounded to mrs spafford how utterly loathsome to her was the idea of food how much she longed to be allowed to sit by her baby's side just as long as she could 
yet she struggled with all this that she knew was sentiment and arose and went out quietly to the dining-room how pretty it looked on this fair morning mrs evans had even stopped to pick three or four fresh roses just budding into bloom and had placed them in a tiny vase beside mrs spafford's plate the table was set for two with much daintier care than had been bestowed on it of late the very freshness of the napkins had a restful look to the matron's weary eyes there was a plate of delicately carefully made toast and a tiny bit of steak broiled to a nicety just as mrs evans thanks to her teacher had long known how to broil no wonder that it all reminded mrs spafford of her afternoon invasion into the kitchen across the way her husband was evidently thinking of it too for thou shalt find it after many days he quoted to her with a meaning smile and then as she tried to give the answering smile the very effort to do so brought the tears and she laid her head on her husband's shoulder and sobbed outright it was better too than to try to bear that heavy strain any longer come he said after a moment of tender silence you are to show your appreciation of this thoughtful kindness and eat some breakfast now it will strengthen you for the day he poured her coffee prepared it carefully cut small bits of the tender steak for her as if she had been a child and although she felt perfectly confident that the very first mouthful would choke her she sat down and ate bits of toast and steak and swallows of hot coffee and rose up refreshed so determined are these bodies of ours to assert their rights no matter what the spirit is being called upon to endure the doctor came promptly as he had promised but it was evident to both father and mother that he saw small need for his coming rather he stood powerless before the need that he felt himself unable to supply he was kind and grave as sympathetic as one could expect a doctor to be who sometimes stood many times a day by the fair cribs of little babies who were slipping away from life the fact is and he drew on his gloves as he said it nature will have to do all that can be done for your child he may rally i have seen children lower than he pull through at last the vitality of these little creatures is something to wonder at stand in awe before in fact there is one thing i should like to see tried if you could go to the seashore with him it might do sea air works miracles sometimes in cases like these and indeed a change of air is a most helpful thing you may continue the medicine as before i'll try to call this afternoon we are likely to have a very sultry day i think good morning and this was all and the dark colored nice fitting gloves were on now and buttoned and he was gone all their hopes went out with him they sat in almost stupefied silence looking not at each other nor at the baby but at nothing trying indeed to look the future in the face go to the seashore to be sure it was not very far away less than half a day's ride on the cars would bring them within the sound of its eternal roar but for all practical purposes so far as they were concerned it might as well have been a thousand miles away mrs spafford's eyes sought the jewel case on the mantel there were three little gleaming dollars within and she knew as well as though she could see inside her husband's pocket that those and a few quarters were all the money they had in the world two dollars of the gold she had paid out mechanically but a few days before when the church collector called she thought of them now thought of the dollars that had lain from time to time within its silken folds one hundred and fifty more than that indeed during the last two years we could take him to the seaside if we had that she did not speak the words even to her heart they just flitted through her mind and there was such a touch of bitterness in them that it startled her still how was she to help wondering whether the money could possibly have done anybody so much good as it would be to save her darling oh warren she said and her voice sounded like a wail couldn't we borrow that money in that box 
and i take it and go a little way with baby he said you know that a very slight change sometimes did great good my poor dear wife don't you remember that what is there would hardly take you to the depot in a carriage such as it would be necessary to have silence for a few minutes then she spoke in tones that were almost desperate warren i could beg for the sake of our child darling i would beg if i knew which way to turn let us think no dear callie let us beg of our father our great rich father he loves our child as even we cannot he will show us the very best to do let us come right to him as children who trust him and beg him to show us the way to step almost before the sentence was finished they were on their knees they were alone again mrs evans had packed the dishes in a scarcely orderly pile and gone swiftly away not pausing even to offer to sit with baby a moment longer or to inquire what else she could do it had occurred to both husband and wife to wonder silently over the suddenness of her departure then each had decided that some home duty must have needed immediate attention she had been long absent several times since she went had the bell rung some kind-hearted neighbor had sent to inquire after baby's health the girls too had rung at the door and inquired and offered help if there was anything they could do and gone their ways people were kind but it was a city where even neighbors were not specially neighborly and the baby had been long sick and none realized how sick he was nor how much in need of help the young people stood none but mrs evans and she had gone to her own cares so they were alone and yet not alone surely the angel of the covenant was with them during that prayer mrs spafford had often heard her husband pray yet the intensity of feeling the perfect abandon of self the overwhelming cry to be hidden from this awful storm that threatened them to be held in the everlasting arms was something that hushed her sobs and almost compelled her to lay hold with strong faith upon the arm of power they were both entirely calmed when they rose up darling her husband asked as he held her with his arm for a minute don't you believe don't you know that he will bring to pass for us that which is best yes she said quietly and at that moment the doorbell rang again a quick emphatic peal End of chapter 20chapter twenty one of the pocket measure by pansy this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty one the answer it is a note for you callie mr spafford said as he returned from answering the loud peal of the bell the man who brought it is waiting for an answer read it please his wife said she was on her knees beside the crib bending over her baby a note from some downtown neighbor expressing sympathy this was what she thought it was very kind but the mother was in the mood just then to feel that human sympathy was a very little thing some day she might be able to thank the writer for kind words she did not think that she wanted to take time from her baby to read them now indeed she expressed as much while her husband was unfolding the sheet did you say he was waiting for an answer i cannot answer notes now then he read my dear mrs spafford i have but this moment heard of your trouble we are on the eve of departure for our seaside house expect to take the ten twenty train i send the carriage with this and my dear friend do you and your husband with all speed get into it with that dear baby and come to us I have known sea air to work marvelous transformations in baby lives. There is no time to lose in preparation. I would not, if I were you, delay one hour. We have a large cottage and ample accommodations for you all, and no more desirable spot could be found for a sick baby. Dick, our coachman, the bearer of this, is entirely reliable and will drive you with the greatest care to the train where we will join you 
the journey is a short one do not wait to do any packing mrs evans through whom i learned just now of your great anxiety will pack a trunk with whatever you can need and express to you promptly meantime she is downtown purchasing under my direction sundry articles which i know to be needful to the comfort of sick babies who travel i am the mother of five children i know all about it my dear friends i feel so sure of your remembering that you are my brother and sister that i do not imagine you as hesitating for a moment on the score of false pride our father has entrusted me with ample means to pay all expenses of every sort and directed me to take you my dear kindred in christ under my care i confidently expect to see you for i know i am following the lead of him who guides you and me mrs evans bade me say that you are only to throw together what may be immediately needed for baby's comfort bring your keys with you to the twenty-third street depot she will meet you there take your directions and attend to whatever may need attention in your home yours in great haste helen v temple long before he had finished reading this remarkable letter mr spafford's voice had broken and his eyes were so dim with tears that he could scarcely make out the words the paper fluttered to the floor at last from his hands and voice too much beyond his control to check its tremble yet spoke with intense feeling before they call i will answer and while they are yet speaking i will hear as for mrs spafford she had one of those merciful fits of really unnatural self-control come over her at that moment the intensely practical part of her nature rose to meet the strain and served her well she rose up from the crib all the pallor gone from her face and spoke in a clear positive voice warren the baby's clothes in the middle drawer you know tumble them into the large valise his little cap and blankets are on the shelf in the clothes press in the blue box my hat lies on the shelf and my sack is hanging beside it is that ten o'clock there is no time to lose oh warren all the pent-up emotion that if she had had time might have found expression let itself out in those two words then she lifted her sleeping baby in her arms and made swift yet tender preparation for a journey i call you to witness to the true nobility of soul apparent in these two that not a momentary thought of shrinking back from the offered hand stretched out with such lavish help occurred to either of them they were simply above shrinking away from help sorely needed and royally offered mrs temple's manner of receiving them at the depot was perfect a quick tender clasp of the hand given to mrs spafford and low-toned words i am so glad you are here in time we need have no confusion he looks really quiet doesn't he the ride down has not disturbed him i have great hope of him change of air is just what he needs mr spafford suppose you seat us in the car while my husband is looking after tickets your wife will be able to get a little rest in the cars i think not a moment's space did she leave for any attempt at thanks on the contrary she simply and in a most natural manner ignored any occasion for them and gave herself entirely to the arrangement of details for the journey mrs evans came at the last moment flushed and breathless with the haste she had made and deposited sundry packages on the seat beside mrs temple received from mr spafford the keys and a few hurried words of explanation and the bell rang and the whistle blew and they were off even then mrs temple contrived to keep their thoughts and her own absorbed by the sick child she was alert and fertile in her suggestions and arrangements for his comfort and he showed his appreciation of her thoughtfulness by continuing his quiet sleep so much more like rest than anything he had taken for days oh you don't know and the worst of it is i cannot describe to you how that upper room in which before night she was domiciled seemed to mrs spafford 
a large bay windowed chamber delicately tinted walls casement windows reaching from floor to ceiling hung with simple muslin curtains india matting on the floor the lightest and simplest of cottage furniture everything pure tasteful restful the windows were set open toward the sunset and just before her there spread out that wonderful sight of which some eyes never tire the white sanded beach washed forever by the ceaseless waves she sat and listened to them as they rolled one after another one after another always and always one after another up and down the sands she heard the steady monotone of their voices as they went on and on in their tireless work she drank in the salt air she watched the curtain sway back and forth in the breeze she watched the baby in the crib lying quiet sleeping breathing in like herself the air that it seemed to her must be health-giving she thought of the breathless room where they had spent but the night before she remembered just how breathless it must be there at this moment and her heart went out in unspeakable gratitude toward those who had of their abundance come to her in her sore need to him who had put it into the hearts of his children to do this blessed thing the door swung softly on its hinges and mrs temple entered her face radiant with some new satisfaction only to look at it was like breathing fresh hope into the mother's heart don't you think dr everett is here she said speaking eagerly he has just sent in his card and asked if he could serve us in any way he is an old friend i took the liberty of sending word to him to call on us immediately i knew you would like to have him see baby now dr everett was a name well known to mrs spafford he came from the same city as themselves and only that very morning when she sat with such a heavy heart looking down at her baby after her physician had buttoned his gloves and departed she had said to herself if i had only asked him to bring dr everett with him if i had only asked warren to go for dr everett this morning what do i care how much he charges to come away up here i could pay him in some way i could beg it then she remembered with another dull thud at her heart that she had heard him bemoaned as out of town now barely a day intervening here was she out of town too by the side of the life-giving sea and behold the great doctor was within reach not only that but was coming that evening to see her baby was not her cup of mercy full isn't it a curious thing that histories which cover weeks of time to live can be grouped and put into a half hour's story the weeks at the seaside which followed this first evening when mrs spafford sat and watched the sun dip down beneath the waves were weeks the memory of which she will carry for ever even into heaven so full of sweet constant merciful loving kindness were they do you think that mrs temple's kindness exhausted itself in the first day's effort it is not so each passing day showed her as a marvel of thoughtful unselfish wisdom thoughtfulness shone in ways that were easy to feel but very hard to tell there was an acceptance of mr and mrs spafford as her guests for the season in a sort of matter-of-course manner she made them feel free to come and go to take and receive as they might have felt in the home of an actual sister ay as it is not possible always to feel even with sisters she made herself one with them in their care and anxiety she almost seemed to lift half the burden from them and bear it herself dr everett made his call and lingered beyond the time that his professional services were required giving rather the care of a skilled nurse he spoke hopefully not too hopefully because they who knew so well on what a thread the baby's life hung would not have been able to trust an emphatic assurance of safety but he unbent from his grave professional air and expressed as well as felt sympathy and promised to come early in the morning 
and came very early and came several times during the day and lingered as he could not have done had he been at home pressed with care all this gave the spaffords a certain relieved feeling that their baby was not merely one of the many sick and suffering babies but a special object of the skilful physician's care the mother expressed something of this feeling to mrs temple one evening and the manner in which that lady answered gave her a little lesson which she hugged to her heart and never forgot i have often thought said the elder lady a touch of sadness in her voice how hard it must be for the great physician to bear with us in our determination to think of his love and care for us only as a piece of that which he bears for the great multitude instead of individualizing it as he constantly teaches us to do and accepting him as caring for us with even more than the exclusive tenderness of love which we give to our own of course it is only a seeming with human physicians they must exclude us when they go from us to others and think only of them but the heart of christ you know is for each as if each were alone in all the world the object of his care mrs spafford had no answer to make for a moment and when she spoke she only said thank you but the words were accompanied by a look which the other lady understood henceforth the young mother thought of christ as bending over her baby in his crib exactly as though there were no other baby on earth to claim his love and skill and her heart was wonderfully comforted still she thanked him daily for the human help and comfort afforded through dr everett as the days passed and he came and went she grew to think of him as a personal friend she looked back often upon that first evening of his coming and smiled over her folly and realized that it was but the vagary of an excited brain to be so glad so very glad that he wore no gloves which he drew on and buttoned as he pronounced in slow quiet words what seemed like a death knell to her hopes how foolish she was why did she care for gloves what difference did it make how slowly the doctor drew them on how carefully he buttoned them yet she found that the scene with just those little accessories had photographed itself on her brain and all the darkness of that breathless morning came back to her associated with that doctor standing beside her baby's crib buttoning those gloves well as the days went by the steady kindness of those ministering never failed among mrs temple's other thoughtful ways there had been introduced to the household a middle-aged calm-faced low-voiced woman who came in noiseless slippers and cool dark dress and the first time she lifted the baby in her arms she cooed to him in so motherly a fashion that he laid his tired little head down on her shoulder and went to sleep then dr everett when he came greeted her with a pleased face and a shake of the hand and stepped to the piazza after mrs spafford to say to her i see you have mrs philbrick here my dear madame she is worth more to a sick baby than forty doctors or even than a mother who is tired as you i recommend you to go to bed and sleep all night baby is safe in her hands for she is the wisest and tenderest nurse i know there had been no talk about a nurse no nervous heart-rending discussion about substituting some other care for the worn yet tireless mothers but mrs philbrick stayed she is an old friend of the family and has come to spend a few days with us was mrs temple's explanation and she was always hovering within call always motioning to the mother to lie down on the bed and let herself be covered with the baby's blanket or a light shawl anything that would not look as though she had given up the baby and succumbed to fatigue and the rests that she took thus were many and life-giving also baby with the rare wisdom common to his age put in his powerful plea for resting both father and mother by taking the most obstinate fancy to nurse philbrick and waiting for her when she disappeared from sight so gradually and quietly she came to be the recognized nurse 
and the mother was learning to turn away from the crib with a great deep sigh of restfulness knowing that the weight of care was being lifted meantime do you think this young couple with not a penny in their purse and no visible means of earning one were able to keep the bewildering future entirely from their thoughts yes they were almost entirely but alas that i should have to admit that the reason was not because of their conquering faith but because all these thoughts were pushed out by a present and absorbing anxiety they could not shut their eyes to the fact that with all the advantages of c air and dr everett and nurse philbrick it was a fierce fight between life and death that was being waged over that one little baby ever present before them was the question how will it end they bore up wonderfully well they made brave efforts to sustain each other to appear grateful and hopeful and in a sense at rest but they did not trust themselves to any confidential talks to any hints as to what might be they just watched and waited it was at the close of a long bright day nearly three weeks since they first came to their seaside retreat an eventful day it had been baby warren had swept quietly through the night had awakened in the morning his face bright with smiles had sat up in nurse philbrick's arms and played a little in the old fashion had taken his cream with a relish unknown for many a day and the mother watching him felt that she had surely a right to let it into her heart that he was genuinely hopefully better all through the day he had sustained this hope returning to many of his pretty baby ways that they had thought laid aside for ever the doctor had spoken not only cheerfully but almost gleefully in his morning call and when he came again in the afternoon had said as he arose to go well friends my unusually long play day is over and i must go back to the city to-morrow morning i have delayed for several days in order to have the pleasure of saying to you madame that i feel perfectly safe in leaving this young man now in your and mrs philbrick's hands i don't think he will need a physician's care any longer then i think the light on mrs spafford's face went a great way toward paying the doctor there had been talk after that much of it of course careful directions given earnest gratitude expressed and more than a hint of the strong feeling that could never be expressed in words and then the doctor had gone away richer by far than when he came for he carried a weight of gratitude from two full hearts and he would be enriched by their prayers so long as they lived to pray it was just at evening and they were alone war had given his last touch of exquisite joy to the full day by playing for a little in the old-time rollicking fashion with his father's beard the indescribable little coo in his happy voice speaking as plainly of returning health and strength as words could have done then he had gone to sleep callie see here her husband said turning aside from the crib where both had been lingering and putting a paper in her hand which by the sudden paleness that spread over her face he knew she recognized as a doctor's bill there it was a long long list of visits from one of the most eminent physicians in a great city but the last line read received payment good measure pressed down and running over leonard everett oh warren mrs spafford said and then this crowning act in their stream of mercies brought for the first time a rush of tears i have not cried before since we left home she said crying and laughing both in one as she spoke they showed it to mrs temple that carefully receipted bill and as they talked together of the doctor's skill and kindness mrs spafford said but the joy is not all ours i think mrs temple it must be glorious to have money to be able to do royal things such as you and dr everett are doing and mrs temple with her hand resting on the younger woman's head made answer hush dear we have no money it is all his 
we are but stewards dr everett recognizes the kinship have we not all one father End of chapter 21